Before giving the floor uh, very quickly to Michael Pfaffel, with whom I will be moderating this session, let me introduce him. Michael is a professor of molecular physiology at the Technical University of Munich in the Wien Stephan School of Life Sciences. I hope that I pronounce well. <laughs> Today, he has reached um, principal investigator status at the Institute of Animal Physiology and Immunology, and is one of the leading scientists in the field of gene quantification and gene expression profile. He is author of more than 200 peer-reviewed publications, 50 book chapters, and has held more than 270 lectures worldwide. He is co-author of the Minimum Information for Publication of Quantitative Real-Time PCR Experiments, Mikey, with lines, and co-author of the d -Mikey with lines for digital PCR. In recent years, he has developed much of his research activity to extracellular vesicles, so he's going to tell us about EV-associated biomarkers in liquid biopsies and how to identify valid biomarker signatures in blood and circulating extracellular vesicles. So, Michael, it's up to you. Thank you, Patrice. Can everybody hear me? Thanks for inviting me. And also, thank you very much for putting the program together, Wendy and all the technical organization. So, uh, my talk is going to be about the EV associated biomarkers in liquid biopsies and how to identify valid biomarker signatures in these circulating IVs, EVs. And yes, everything is working, so I'm happy. <laughs> so, uh, the interest in EVs and uh, People often call them exosomes, but exosomes is just a fraction of, of the EVs, is dramatically increasing. Here you see a screenshot from the 70 where it started uh, up to now, it's about four or more than 4,000 publications. And the field of EV is very widespread, so it goes for over therapies, biomarker, vaccine development, a drug delivery, and also nutraceuticals. My talk today is more focusing using the EVs and the uh, associated uh, nucleic acid, mainly a microRNA, as biomarkers for diagnostic purposes. And if we are talking about uh, liquid biopsy, we have the classical candidates like circulating tumor cells, uh, circulating free DNA, and also uh, like free microRNA. And the newest candidate is definitely uh, the exosomes, or we call it in the group of exocellular vesicles. And we are not focusing alone on microRNA, but today, of course, I will focus on microRNA uh, uh, in detail. Uh, but in our group, we started also to focus on other RNA subclasses like mRNA and long non coding RNA to generate a kind of yeah, uh, integrative uh, network of uh, the transcribed RNAs. What are you going to do with this information uh, in these uh, liquid biopsies? So we are mainly uh, diagnosing or researching blood samples, uh, serum samples, plasma samples. We also had studies uh, using urine in a doping case, but uh, in an other perspective like agriculture, we are using milk. Uh, uh, but in human patients, uh, also often stool and saliva will be used for diagnostic and uh, later on for prognostic reasons and in the later stage as well for personalized therapeutics or disease monitoring. So uh, what is uh, microRNA or often it's also called like extracellular RNA? And people mainly thinking that it's intrinsically stable in blood and these other bioliquids, but this is wrong. So uh, the nucleic, uh, circulating nucleic acid must be either bound to proteins or must be protected by vesicle to be stable in the circulation. And here you see a couple of examples like RNA or microRNA is bound to agonide proteins 
or is covered in kind of shedding vesicles, exosomes, microvesicles, or even in bigger ones like ap apoptotic bodies, or as well in HDL associated uh, vesicles where mRNA or microRNA can appear. Uh, but the variety of vesicles is big. So one question will be, uh, uh, which is the best EV uh, to, to use for your analysis? Is it the exosome, the microvesicles, the ectosome, or the majority of all extra uh, vesicles, of all extracellular vesicle? Or if you're not focusing on vesicles, maybe the full blood, the blood cells, the cell free compartment. Uh, is a better analyte or a, a better blood compartment for developing a microRNA biomarker signature. And then, hence a short introduction, uh, because this might be new to some of you, about the diversity of uh, uh, vesicles uh, in you know, vertebrates, we can look like this. So on the left side, you have a kind of a ruler from very small particles like the AGV or the coronavirus with around about 100 nanometers up to uh, E. coli with two micrometers or a small cell like an erythrocyte with seven micrometers. And we have kind of comparable uh, uh, vesicles in comparable sizes like the biggest one. These are the so-called apoptotic bodies coming, of, of course, uh, as remaining from the apoptotic from the uh, apoptotic cell, from the dying cells. These are the biggest ones with one to five micrometers. Then we have, of course, malignant cells where we get alkosomes from it. Or, and then we have the, the so-called living cells where we have the smallest particles, which is more in our interest and, 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 and the most interesting group because they are not a kind of a, like a rubbish bin, like the apoptotic bodies. They are assumed to be uh, communicators or uh, to be vesicles with a specific information. And here, of course, the, the exosomes with around 100, 150 nanometers or even smaller ones like exomeres are very interesting to us for diagnostic purposes. Uh, what is the reason of these vesicles? It's a kind of exchange of extracellular RNA between cells. So we have here the green and the red cell, a stem cell as an example, and an injured cell. They exchange uh, information via the vesicle and also via the containing RNA. As I said, mRNA, microRNA, and long encoding arm might be interesting, but they also have as well surface receptor and also proteins. Uh, uh, surface proteins and intracellular or interluminal uh, proteins, and of course, uh, a lot of other stuff. But we are focusing here in my group more or less on the transcriptomics in connection to these uh, uh, EVs, also all kind of uh, uh, EVs together. And here you have uh, the, the transmission uh, process from a shedding cell where you have uh, multivesicular bodies which are covering the, the, the ex, uh, exosomes and then these uh, multivesicular bodies um, fuse uh, with, the, with the membrane and the exosome can travel throughout the bloodstream to a so-called recipient cells and they can signal in different ways either they have an endocytosis of these uh, uh, exosomes or the surface protein of this exosome is binding to uh, receptor mediated uh, endocytosis or is binding to this recipient cell or they just fuse with these cells. But anyway, they transport information from the shedding uh, uh, cell uh, to the recipient cell either by microRNAs or RNAs which are in or at or associated to these uh, vesicles or these surface protein activates the uh, uh, address or the recipient cell. So summarizing this, these uh, vesicles have a kind of hormone-like uh, uh, function in the organism. Say will be released by, here is an example, by endocrine cells or by any kind of tissue. They travel through the bloodstream and have a target cell where they transport uh, information like hormones. But just in a bigger scope because they have lots of microRNAs, they have lots of surface receptors. So we have then a, a 
vital communication in the human body or uh, yeah, in the body of the um, vertebrate. Okay, so what is the advantage of these vesicles? Why uh, extracellular vesicles can't be used just the cells or the serum or the exosomes? So this was a kind of uh, a visibility study we performed a couple of years ago for the early detection of uh, diseases. In this case, it was sepsis. And therefore, we sampled uh, a blood uh, and divided it in three compartments. So we uh, took 14 patients, uh, uh, analyzed the whole blood, the PAX gene, the serum, and we isolated the exosomes or the exosome-associated RNA, all was calculated back to a starting volume of one milliliter blood. And here uh, we are, you see the results of the uh, next generation sequencing uh, at these days. Here in red, you see the microRNAs. And of course, you see that the exosomes and serum have less reads compared to the whole blood, to the PAX gene. But if you look here on the right hand uh, uh, graph, you see that the, 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 the exosomes have a much more information compared or over the serum. And therefore, we, we, we uh, assume that the, the exosomes have a kind of uh, a protection, a purpose, and a concentration of these microRNAs in the serum. And if we look further on, on the detected uh, kind of uh, significant regulated microRNAs between the healthy and the sepsis patient, you clearly see that the exosomes and the serum share more or less the most uh, biomarkers, of course, the exosomes are part of the serum, and the cells have totally different, a uh, totally different uh, biomarker signature. And in these feasibility studies, uh, in in the sepsis patient, we discovered, as I said, it's a feasibility study. The first uh, biomarkers uh, of the first microRNAs, which are uh, um, uh, associated to exosomes, uh, and we got uh, indicators for different septic uh, 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 septic shock or sepsis, uh, uh, and therefore we found the first significant candidates, single candidates. Even uh, if you're thinking about uh, a, a hospitalization, even uh, uh, even to, to, to prognose a, a survivor or a non-survivor uh, after this septic shock. These are not strong data, but this is just a feasibility study. Should we use exosomes for these kind of uh, diagnostic purposes? And we could say yes, they are able, they are able to that we can use them for uh, uh, diagnostic purposes. We, <coughs> sorry, we summarized this in a, in a short uh, review. Uh, uh, and, and had two headings, uh, one on the one hand, the advantage of EV-associated microRNAs, and uh, of course, uh, using them as a molecular biomarker signature. But why they have an advantage? Of course, the EV are part of the liquid biopsy, and it's assumed that they are not really invasive. MicroRNAs are short molecules. Uh, they are kind of stable marker compared to longer, like long non coding or mRNAs. The microRNA in or at the EV, still a matter of debate where they are exactly. Uh, they are pro but definitely they are protected and concentrated at this level of the EV. And a couple of microRNA together form an expression uh, uh, signature, which is a specific information. And even this expression change of this uh, signature allows an early uh, evaluation of uh, physiological or pathological changes. So if we use sensory signature later on as a molecular biomarker signature, we can amplify this easily via RTQ-PCR uh, at very low abundances. And this signature or a couple of these uh, uh, microRNA together are indicators for physiological and pathological situations and can be directly related to disease stages. And of course, doing this, you have to follow uh, like the MIKEY guidelines or the MYSAFE guidelines for quality control to be precise, reproducible, and do this in an objective manner. So, so the first goal was to establish a MYSAFE compliant workflow, uh, which should be fast and reproducible, should be reliable in the daily clinical practice, and should be suitable for microRNA-based biomarker discovery. And therefore, we optimize these EV isolation methods and 
this was all uh, put together in an, a nice paper. But uh, the, the, the first uh, demand is to standardize your whole uh, scientific workflow. In our case, it's in tissue sampling or blood sampling, EV isolation, EV characterization, afterwards RNA extraction, sequencing, and later on as well, the PCR for the validation methods. And therefore, uh, they were developed during the last year, they were developed very nice MySIF guidelines by Jan Lötwer or Kenneth Witwer or together with Clotilde Terry. Uh, uh, and uh, there's already a fourth paper <coughs> in action or under development, let's talk it like, tell it like this. Uh, and the MySIF uh, checklist uh, has kind of six main headings which you should follow the nomenclature, the, the collection of the pre-processing, the ED separation and concentration, and the characterization. I will focus on this today very much, the characterization of EVs. And uh, if you're working with functional uh, studies, you should also uh, uh, follow this mic line to, to, uh, for reporting and functional uh, assays. So first, uh, we compared different isolation methods uh, uh, based on different uh, chemical principles and also from different companies because we used kits to be highly standardized uh, and characterized the EVs from the morphology, from the surface marker, used various methods like uh, transmission electron microscopy, nanotracking analysis uh, or, or uh, proteomics like Western plot. And then uh, we compared these different methods in terms of efficiency, in terms of a different uh, 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 gene expression on the uh, microRNA level. And here, just a few uh, screenshots. Uh, we used several different kits available on the market. So these are all the same uh, patient samples, all based on, on one milliliter, and you clearly see using different isolation kits you end up with different kind of sub fractions of ev here you see the size uh, in uh, in a box plot so the, the, the solid box is covering more or less 50 percent uh, of the vesicles isolated and you see that the the xor and ec the precipitation methods uh, isolate totally different uh, uh, evs compared let's say to the ultra centrifugation or the size exclusion uh, uh, applying a qev but nevertheless, all of these are isolated exosomes. All of these have different sizes. But here on the transmission electron microscopy, you clearly see uh, these are all uh, double membrane uh, covered vesicles in the right dimension. Here you see the size of, of 100 nanometers. So they are all 150 to 200 nanometers, either single or multiple vesicles from these isolates. Second uh, is all the surface markers. So we have kind of positive, we have negative markers, positive EV markers nowadays, CD63, CD81, CD9, Syntinin, TSG101, negative markers like IGO2 protein or calexine. And of course, we also have protein contamination throughout the isolation process like albumin. And you see uh, that in almost all the uh, uh, isolation process, we could find the positive marker. We could not find the negative markers. We could find different uh, uh, um, uh, concentrations of uh, protein contamination, depending on the isolation chemistry and isolation techniques. And for some, like mercury or ultra centrifugation, we had to apply a, a yodoxol density gradient. I'm pretty sure that Anne will later on tell you in much more detail about these isolation methods. Therefore, we have to concentrate uh, as the samples at a different density. And then we found as well uh, uh, for mercury or ultra centrifugation, the positive markers in these isolation methods. To make a long story short, uh, we found EVs, or we could isolate EVs or exosomes in, uh, and uh, with the right size, with the right markers. And then we, uh, we, 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 we sequenced them and we got different results from the sequencing in terms of the read count. So the read counts are uh, in the range of uh, 10 by the power of six to 10 by the power of uh, seven uh, different uh, reads. 
and as well uh, uh, the quality marks of these recons are kind of different uh, because we developed own quality marks meaning kind of false positive reads like short fragments uh, less than uh, 16 reads or ribosomal uh, 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 reads which are covered more or less in the in the in the microRNA reads or a tRNA halves mainly and uh, if we, we we are staging these kind of um, uh, quality marks in red uh, yellow and green green is for good uh, you could see that uh, depending on the different isolation methods uh, that the mercury and uh, the XORNEZ and the ultra centrifugation are the better methods for, for, for EV isolation uh, for the purpose of uh, microRNA biomarker development and other methods like QEV or exospin are not that optimal. As I said before, we are just looking on the microRNA biomarker signature in these studies. This has nothing to do QEVs give great uh, exosomes, but at lower level and with high protein value, let's let's mention it like this. Uh, but for microRNA purposes, kind of the, the crude EVs, how we call them, the crude EVs, uh, the precipitated EVs by Berkeley are uh, a better suited. Okay, if you cluster then all these data, you clearly see that there is a significant impact of the isolation methods. So you, uh, you, you see that the microRNA, the ultra centrifugation, and the XRNA are clustering very strongly, meaning uh, you have a, a, a real impact of the isolation method on the later biomarker signature and on the isolated. A microRNA and also on the amount of the isolated microRNA, which is depicted here, uh, where we just uh, calculate the twofold expression differences between the healthy and the uh, sepsy patients here at the first day of uh, hospitalization. You clearly see with these uh, a better or higher amount of reads in mercury, exorne, easy, exospin, and QEV. In 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 this in this kind of order, you clearly see you have much more uh, uh, significantly regulated biomarkers available to develop a signature later on in these two methods compared to the others. Only 19 microRNA could be discovered in all of these isolation methods, but definitely the most candidates or putative candidates you find later on, of course, in these a family of uh, microRNA isolates. And from these uh, significantly uh, found genes in next generation sequencing, we always do a confirmation. We are uh, RTQPCR. Here we took 10, uh, the 10 most downregulated, the 10 most high upregulated genes and try to confirm them in a kind of orthogonal uh, uh, independent method, which is not quite right, but it's an independent method. And uh, if you do these kind of research, it's often not the case. You find the same results, uh, what you found before in sequencing. But here, if you see these correlation right, more or less we find uh, the same genes in the same um, 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 regulation. Uh, uh, of course, we got differences in, 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 the, in the power of regulation. Uh, but we could confirm the genes. So let's sell it like this. And out of these uh, genes, this was kind of all a second uh, 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 feasibility study, which assay is the best to isolate the EVs. You clearly see here uh, the red uh, two uh, uh, clouds are the X are easy, which are kind of separated in this principal component analysis. Means you clearly could separate the, the sepsis patient from the health is the same as well with the blue one here, the microarray. And a little bit closer together or with not at optimal uh, kind of uh, separation of the groups are the QEV and the exospin uh, uh, isolates, but still it, you have a significant uh, uh, yeah, difference between the two patient groups. So this paper was published by uh, Dominic Bushman in CHEF, and uh, this was the starting point to go really then uh, later on in the clinical samples and the clinical samples mean can we do uh, uh, can we use the microRNA for EV based decision making 
Therefore, we developed uh, in a learning cohort, we developed a microRNA signature, we classified the uh, sepsis patient, and later on, we did a physiological uh, classification. So we had two cohorts. We started with the first training cohort of 67 um, uh, sepsis patients, EV isolation, RNA extraction, small library prep, sequencing, a multivariate data analysis, of course, then a differential gene expression, PCA and PLSDA. In between, we always had kind of quality control step. And at the end, of course, we conf confirmed the data via our TQ-PCR. And hence, from this uh, training cohort, we uh, discovered the first kind of a candidate microRNA biomarker signature. Uh, yeah, here, to just go over the, the data, here you see um, the, the patient groups. We started with five, uh, then we, we summed up to three. But here you see the microRNA reads are all in the range of 30 to 40 percent, uh, maybe back. And as well, uh, we had also minimal inclusion criteria. At least one million microRNA, mi microRNA reads, uh, and uh, at least 15 percent microRNA in every read, which is included in this study. Because some sepsis uh, patient really delivered, yeah, let's say strange blood results. Let's tell it like this, because they were uh, highly diseased and, of course, uh, uh, also highly treated with antibiotics. Michael, you have still five minutes. Okay, I, I can manage this, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Patrice. Uh, we started with five different groups, different uh, stages of pneumonia, mild, severe, uh, septic shock, and as well, acute respiratory distance syndrome called ARDS and uh, evaluated the significantly regulated gene and uh, using the PCA analysis, uh, you could see uh, that the volunteers group are quite good together, but the, all the other patients are totally mixed up. Therefore, we must go for other statistical methods, so we could not find a real good cluster in this PCA analysis, and hence we did a PLSDA means as this is a supervised clustering where you tell the software which patient groups uh, the software should separate in looking for the uh, really discriminating biomarkers. Uh, and this turned out, okay, this is PDF normally, this is rotating, uh, as that we could, yeah, not clearly separate, but at least we could separate the patient groups. Here you see the, the, the volunteers are group, uh, quite grouped together. And also the severe uh, groups uh, uh, group together, uh, but uh, we could not separate the mild or the community acquired pneumonia from the severe cases. This is also depicted here on the on the uh, rock curves. And then we decided to make only three patient groups: so the healthy volunteers, the, the really the deceased patients with the. Uh, severe pneumonia, we say ARDS, sepsis, and the kind of mild pneumonia. And we see three groups. We also could define the biomarker signature with 12 microRNAs for a separation. And in these training cohorts, this is the upper uh, a graph. We found a training accuracy uh, of these biomarkers from 92 to 99 percent, depending on the treatment groups. And using then later on PCR, using these 12 biomarkers, we could uh, uh, predict in an independent uh, cohort with 75 patients and could uh, uh, foresee a community acquired pneumonia with 83 sepsis with 87 percent, and overall with about. Uh, 73%. So we were quite happy uh, with these results uh, since this was the first study where we can uh, diagnose sepsis on the level of isolated uh, vesicles and on the basis of 12 microRNAs. Of course, in this signature, there were, of course, kind of leaders or marker microRNAs. There are this kind of cis3. Uh, which if you depict them alone, you clearly see that there is a significant regulation. And if you even focus only on these three, this is depicted here under mean value under B, even you can do a forecast uh, at day 
one at day of, hosp of hospitalization uh, um, uh, 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 how severe the sepsis can be. So the se severe sepsis cases have the, the lowest sum up um, 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 uh, um, uh, expression compared to CAP or volunteers. Later on, we uh, uh, did as well IPA analysis to, to see if this microRNA makes sense. And of course, IPA told us that this cellular humor and immune uh, network, antimicrobial response network, and pathogen influencing signaling. So C12 makes sense to us. And then I come to the summary of uh, this study or these various studies. And there were a lot of papers generated out of these last nearly five years. We could establish a massive compliant uh, EV uh, a workflow uh, and then a good EV characterization. Uh, EVs show more significant results uh, compared to whole blood or, 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 or plasma. And uh, EV precipitation methods here in our case, mercury and XOR and EASY are well suited for microRNA based microRNA signature. We did a learning cohort, a validation cohort, and could predict the results with 73%. And what is the outlook for this winter? Of course, we are implementing more patients. I announced as well uh, COVID results, but uh, the COVID cohorts still have to grow. So we are still sampling uh, different stages, different uh, uh, causes, uh, different QSOFA scoring from, from sepsis, uh, different Horowitz scores. Yet. And the goal is, of course, to discover new diagnostic and predictive markers for pneumonia, for sepsis, for ARDS, and for COVID-19. And at the end, I want to thank, of course, all the collaborators. This, this was a, a joint study of the TUM, of my group, more or less, of the gene core group, the sequencing group for Christine Wormsa, um, as well uh, from the LMU and also a, a second hospital, a Clinicum Kerala, um, 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 was influenced, and as well a company and also the, the funders. This was ZIM, uh, funded by the Bundesministerium für Wirtschaft und Energie. And at the end, I want to thank you, thank you. for uh, joining my talk. Here you see some screenshots and want to invite you as well to the next meeting starting in March here in Freising and Stefan. And of course, one of the key topics is SARS liquid biopsy and multiomics biomarker. And I'm looking forward for your questions. So thanks very much for joining my talk. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think we have the time for a few short